if you are a regular viewer of this channel you will know and of my videos you will know that i have been covering pirate chain which in my opinion is the most secure and most private of all the cryptocurrencies going so if you value privacy like i do you will have followed the fortunes of pirate chain you will also know that they recently launched one of the founder members of the bpsaa this is a group of four currently four cryptocurrency projects that are working together collaborating sharing resources in order to further mass adoption and they all work in ways that are sympathetic and synchronous with each other they all work well together and I'm, what i'm going to be doing in this video is interviewing one of the team from one of these projects so you can find out how that is and how it what it is and how it ties in with pirate chain and the other projects all right so please hold on for that subscribe comment all that business follow me on this channel and all the other channels and also on my twitter and please follow me on twitter which is at crypto rich yt here we go Tired of just playing for fun? Make a living just by playing your favorite games. You can make anywhere from 1% to 1,000% return depending on the difficulty of the game. Play, win, earn, betverse. Good morning, good afternoon, Primate. Thank you so much for making yourself available. And uh, Thanks for having me, Crypto Rich. You are so welcome. And you are one of the team from Ether1, which we're going to talk about, and they're part of the BPSAA. What is it? What, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and then you got into blockchain. Um, so I've been in IT for the last 20 years. I really got into the blockchain in 2017, kind of mid-year when things were going up. Soon I realized that I want to be in small cap crypto projects because right. that's where I can have the most impact on the ecosystem. So just kind of been doing that. I found my project when I discovered Ether1 after some failed... Uh, but necessary experiments, yes. you know, in, in the ecosystem, learning things by doing, by making mistakes, that okay. sort of a thing. And what do you do at Ether1? So when I first started with Ether1, I just came in as a regular community person that just wanted to improve the project, right? <laughs> so I kind of just had ideas, worked my way up a little bit, uh, and became a project manager for them. Then the plan was always to uh, decentralize and start a community council. So what I did was I stepped down from my project management position, gave up most of my rights and ran for council. And uh, now I'm one of seven people that um, control the uh, funding of the project. And we're also um, steering all the projects and uh, making some community decisions together as a team, along with the uh, old management team of Ether One, which consists of uh, James, Fallen and Treehouse. Right. OK. Now, is it the council is like a regulatory governing body of Ether One? That's correct. Uh, it does regulate and govern the project. It controls the purse and it decides who controls the uh, social media with the goal always being to decentralize everything. And one of the major goals of this is right now the uh, not the permanent council, but the provisional council. And one of the jobs of the provisional council is to come up with a founding document, a constitution, if you will, of a governance system that doesn't rely on any centralized parts and can function distributed on the internet without there being any single uh, key holder, even for things like your domain registration. Every project has project name that crypto or whatever, and that stays with a single person and that's tied to a uh, coin market cap. So if that goes away, you're kind of in big trouble. I've had a lot of projects go away for that reason because they lost their social media. So we're working with coin market cap to uh, set up enclaves for either one multiple trusted domain holders that kind of work in consensus to uh, control who has uh, social media powers, kind of checking each other. Oh. We're uh, working the logistics of that out now with a coin market cap. It's a new process for everyone. Wow, 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 That's, that is amazing. That is very, very interesting. I, I'm interested by it, right? So let's go into Ether1. I'm gonna share my screen with you. And let's have a look. So here is the Ether1 website decentralize everything and it is um let me get rid of this ether1.org and i'll have the links in the description below for you know for people going to do their due diligence and check it out right now i don't understand this at all i don't have a technical background so please talk me through this what does ether1 do what we mainly do 
other than what we're doing with our governance, our technical side is an IPFS based storage solution that takes data uploaded by users and puts them on community hosted nodes that are highly uh, distributed, uh, redundant, can be taken down and stores them in there. Uh, and it's all paid in ETHO. And these community nodes uh, are run by community members like you and me, for example, I run a few nodes myself. Mm -hmm. So I host this information and I get paid uh, from the block reward. And there's also a second revenue stream with the ETHOFS uh, revenue sharing that just uh, enabled this year. Okay. So it's basically community hosted for the community. Okay. All right. So, so let me, let me pick apart some of what you said. So IPFS, that's interplanetary file storage system. Is that right? Yes, that's right. It's a technology that allows multiple people to provide servers and to uh, redundantly host content, which is constantly being shuffled between their nodes. So it is very resistant to uh, distributed denial of service attacks and generally hard to take down. Right. OK. Is it fast? What kind of um, information can be stored on it? So basically anything can be stored on it. Um, things get broken down into smaller pieces and these pieces get reshuffled between all the uh, servers that are hosting them. So any size of information uh, is, is acceptable. Okay, so uh, it sounds to me like a little bit like how BitTorrent works. Is that right? It's, it's very similar to BitTorrent, uh, Swarm, similar technologies. You know, it's the, the devil's in the details. IPFS is one of a variety of implementations that are very popular now. I'm beginning to uh, get grassroots support, uh, allowing people to um, decentralize how data is hosted, not just on a central repo somewhere in the cloud that a single organization has control of, but kind of a more broadly public defined storage that everyone knows how it works, everyone knows how it's encrypted, where it goes, what the rules are, and that not a single entity a, um, can take down this information without giving any good reason. Right, right, okay. And then, um... It, the data is hashed and encrypted on the IPFS, so it can't be seen. I mean, can you can you can you store large files, or is it just for text data? Can you store videos? And so we have uploaded information of up to five hundred megabytes using the old upload system. Mm -hmm. Now we're working on a command line based upload system that should uh, really increase that uh, size that we can upload. But so far, I don't have any hard metrics for you. But safe to say that I think a couple of gigabytes won't be a problem. But what's even more cool than that is if you have a JavaScript, uh, CSS, and HTML website, you can throw it up there. And you can, uh, if you have a, a domain name, you can link your domain name to your EthoFS upload and then give people that link. And they'll access your website and it'll live on EthoFS. So you don't have to pay a GoDaddy. You don't have to give your name to anyone. And your content is up there reliably protected. Wow. Okay, and that's that system is live right now. Yes, it's been live for almost a year now. And and do you have any websites that are that are using the system yet? You're looking at it now. You mean the Ethos One website? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Let's go back. Right. <laughs> so, let me see. Let me see. Okay, so this website, Ether One website, is on the Ether One system. That's right. We have instructions in our documentation repo of how you can do this today. Okay. It's a very clean looking, well designed website. And this means no government, no, no central agency, no actor can take it down. Yes. And what we're doing with governance by creating enclaves that are independently controlled, there's cross coverage and cross control of media. It makes sure that there is really no single entity on any place of the planet, any jurisdiction any land that is singly in control of the project, which is the intention of it. And a no and natural question will be, well, what if people upload stuff that should be taken down? Yes. You know, this is a legitimate I concern. You read I know, I know. I could see. <laughs> You've done this before, right? You've spoken about yeah, this before. a couple of times. <laughs> so with that concern in mind, we have a system being developed of subscribing to blacklists of pins that you don't want to host. So basically, if somebody is concerned enough that information is uploaded there that is unacceptable, they can take up the initiative and create a service that will publish all the banned 
content that shouldn't be hosted verifiably. Mm -hmm. And then other node operators can subscribe to uh, this feed and essentially comply with whatever they're asking to comply with, just like anyone else. You know, if you're in the United States, you get a knock on your door, you say, okay, I will subscribe to this blacklist and I will no longer be in breach of whatever the concerns are. While right. other people in different jurisdictions, they can make the appropriate choices for themselves. Okay, okay. Now I can see how that would uh, be useful and effective with, say, sites that promote hate or violence or criminal activity or pedophilia or something, right? But what if it's something, it's just a point of view, you know, sites that are all about anti-vaccines or a particular political perspective? What's to stop those going on the blacklists? That is a very legitimate concern. And what I have in my view is that there will be multiple levels of blacklists that you can subscribe to, just like anything else. Mm. The blacklist should be controlled by a single entity and they will also get oversight based on what gets blocked on them. So I feel like the free market will figure out a way to make sure, of course, with our help, to make sure that there's no single central party that controls uh, you know, what, what gets uploaded to the network and po possibly maybe even denial of services. This um, We're working to design it in such a way that that will be very hard to do. Right, okay, okay, all right. All right, and when, when did the project start? Uh, the project started in May of 2018. And did you do an ICO or how did you raise money? Uh, basically, there's no ICO, there's no pre-mine. Uh, it was fairly launched and that's one of our things. We don't want to encumber the project with any machinations that it doesn't have to have. So right. we're all self-funded. We've been running on a shoestring budget since inception. Um, I came on uh, six months after the uh, founding, but you know we've never really had to be a, bu a big budget. Uh, the project is very sustainable. We have identified the costs of it, and we're working to spread them around uh, the council. So even you know within a month or two, the official infrastructure of the project will be decentralized as it should be, and we're always moving into the uh, decentralized, decentralized, decentralized uh, direction. Okay. All right. Well, let's look at the, the coin or the token. Token of, so Ether1, so immediately I think of Ethereum, which you've probably heard before as well, other people say to you, right? <laughs> and Ether, <laughs> Ether is actually the, the, the name of the token that runs on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, yes, yeah. Etho is the name of the native currency of, of Ether1, just like ETH is the native currency of Ethereum. Right, so Ether1, what, what, is, what, what sort of uh, protocol is it? So the way, the reason why we need to have a separate chain is, you know, really that's what the question is asking. Why are you not Ethereum? Ethereum is great. Yeah, it's, it's not that expensive. Why are you not Ethereum, especially when you've got a name that's like Ethereum? <laughs> exactly. And the thing is, we really love Ethereum. We think yeah. Ethereum is great technology. It's the most proven one out there. And the reason why we started by copying that project is because we, we love what they're doing, but we have this, these uh, ETHOFS nodes and they need to be paid and we don't want to have that centralized. So what most ETHash uh, based projects do is uh, the ones that have master nodes is they have you know a central VPS sitting somewhere and it's paying all the different master nodes every day, right? So we don't want to have that. So what we're doing is we're taking the, uh, the Ethereum consensus uh, mechanism that pays all the nodes and we're modifying it so it pays our ethofs nodes automatically so there is no developer pressing buttons it is paying nodes that are uh, online based on criteria that's acceptable to us and this way we're decentralizing a kind of a second layer of the blockchain right right okay and then um is it is it a fork of ethereum is it you know is it a fork of bitcoin what is it mine it's not mine it's staked is that right uh, it's staked, but our staking works differently, and we can go over that. Yeah. Um, so it's not a fork of anything because all the balances were zero uh, during inception. Mm -hmm. It is a clone of Ethereum, and we uh, do very well to stay up to date with all the latest improvements that they have done to the protocol. So whatever they improve on, we review it, and most mostly we accept it. Like, for example, their new DNS um, they, they have enabled us to give names to our boot servers, not just IP addresses. And this is going to make it a lot easier to make sure that no boot note ever goes down because all we have to do is change a reference on the internet and not have to modify the code to uh, 
change the book notes. Okay. All right. So how so how does the staking work then? So most of the time, the way that staking works is you have a wallet, you have a balance, and you say, I want to stake this balance. Mm -hmm. And then it's either not accessible to you anymore for a certain period, or you can take it out right away. But in the meantime, you're earning you know, these staking coins. What we have going on with our staking portal at staking.ethofs.com is we bring people that have um, the necessary ETH stake to run an ETHOFS node and people that have VPS servers or servers at home or you know some sort of access to machines with unique public IP addresses per every node, we bring these uh, parties together and the node operator can take a staked amount from the stake provider and run a node with it. And then the rewards get split between the two parties. So it's kind of a way to decentrally uh, run a master node with two parties. One of them doesn't have the money, and one of them doesn't have the servers. Right. So, for example, I, you may have the servers in your home, right? I just have a couple of laptops, but I may have the, the coins. Mm -hmm. and you and I get together. I, do I give you the coins, or are they locked or something? Do I still hold uh, You give the coins to a smart contract that has very specific rules on it. One of them can be you can set up a node. It's the rules of the smart contract are set up to protect both parties. So let me just summarize how the process works. The uh, stake provider provides the stake, then the node operator sees that contract and takes it. And then after that, the node operator has seven days to produce a paying node. If that doesn't happen, then the origination fee of the node operator gets forfeited. It's an amount of uh, you know 150 to uh, even 2,000 ETO. So if you're not serious about setting up a node, don't take a contract that uh, protects from that. Then within the first 28 days, if the uh, node operator doesn't have a properly running and paying node, then the person that provides the stake can also take the origination fee back. Now, after 30 days of a properly running and properly paying node, either party can dissolve this uh, smart contract and everyone gets their money back and the rewards stay. Right, right. Or they can just carry on. Carry yes, on. most people, so far, 98% of uh, people have decided to stay. Right. So, okay, so one thing, it seems to me, this is a way that somebody who has a server or uh, enough coins to stake can earn passive income in terms of the rewards. Yes, absolutely. This is a great way to get some coins if you don't want to KYC, if you just want to 